Welcome to Movie Oubliette, the film review podcast for movies that most people have mercifully forgotten. I'm Dan. And I'm Conrad. And in each episode, we drag a forsaken film out of the Oubliette. Discuss it and judge it to decide whether it should be set free. (laughs) Or whether it should be thrown back and consigned to oblivion forever. Greetings, listeners, and welcome to Movie Oubliette, the transcontinental film review podcast. With me, Dan, wondering whether I could somehow train my dog to wipe his filthy paws when he comes inside in Melbourne, Australia. (laughs) And me, Conrad, trying to stay upright in 50 mile an hour winds in Cambridge, UK. In this podcast, we discuss forgotten genre films, sci-fi, fantasy and horror, because nothing is more thrilling than witnessing an alien anatomy saving the world from a disgusting, giant, predator-looking dark overlord. (laughs) Conrad, how are you today? I'm very well. How are you? Have you recovered from The Hollow Man? Ah, yes. Well, there's a few things I I did want to mention uh, that my wife actually said, and one of them was her take on the whole costume of the early 2000s was Mm. the, the cut of top that Elizabeth Shue wears is called a boat neck top. And I didn't even know that was a thing. No. So what is that? Is it sort of square rather than round? Is that what it is? or Across the neck, sort of straight cut, but it's quite wide, yeah. but not quite to the shoulders. So it's, it's yeah. that very, I don't know, late 90s, early 2000s. So you're seeing it everywhere now. Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to say... I should have said it, the most early 2000s thing about Hollow Man was the DVD menu screen. Holy crap, <laughs> it looked old. It reminded me of those kind of CD ROMs at school in the 90s, like Microsoft Encarta or something, just jam packed full of bad <laughs> graphics and animations. <laughs> oh, wow. I had the Blu ray, so I didn't have the same experience, no, unfortunately. Right. No, so. it's, uh, yeah, that. <laughs> That dates the film even more. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) How's your week been, Conrad? Oh, crazy busy. Uh, It's been storming here and we had Extinction Rebellion doing demonstrations in the centre of Cambridge and blocking up roads. And so, yeah, it's been pretty crazy. Oh, yeah. Tough. I've been getting through it. So, yeah, it's fun. You made it through (laughs) the week. I made it through the week. And one fun thing that's kept me going is I took up the free one month subscription of Shudder, which I haven't tried before, the streaming oh, service. right. Trying things out on there. I don't know if anybody out there has got a Shudder subscription wants to recommend things to me. I'd love to hear your recommendations for sure. I've been trying their Creepshow TV series because ah. our previous guest, David Bruckner's directed a couple of those segments. So I'm interested to see how that turns out. Yes, yes, yes. I think it was Anthony Darrington from Something Ghoulish who was our guest in our yeah. Shutter episode that mentioned yes. it as well. And it's pretty popular, so... I'm hoping to find some gems in there. Mm, Any gems in the mailbag today, Conrad? Well, we had a message from Isaac Sutton who just wanted to give us a shout out to Movie Oubliette for releasing Return to Oz because I just watched it on Disney Plus while under the effects of flu and wowza. I don't think I could have picked a better film to experience in this state. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. (laughs) No, I said to him, how did you fare during the Mombi decapitation hall of many heads scene whilst having Ah, a fever? And he said, yeah, it was pretty wild. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. Wow. Get well soon, Isaac. Yes. And today, Conrad, what movie are we doing? Ah, Let me wander over to the oubliette and find out. Mm. Wow. It's a dive bar in here. It's pretty busy. Oh, yeah. Stinky, too. Mmm. Bands warming up. Barkeep, give me a fuzzy duck and a movie. Thanks very much. That's it. No more Mr. Nice Duck. (laughs) It's heaving in there. Mm, Refreshing. Mm. What do you have, Conrad? Well, I have for us Howard the Duck. (laughs) 
Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Heard so much about this movie, but I've never seen it. What's it about? Who's in it? So it's a 1986 American science fiction comedy film directed by Willard Huyck and starring Leah Thompson, Jeffrey Jones and a very young Tim Robbins. Mm. <laughs> and this one was picked for us by our listeners. Thanks, listeners. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> yeah. So in this movie, Howard is a disillusioned 20-something advertising copywriter in a world where ducks have evolved into the dominant species and decided to name everything with grown-worthy duck puns. Mm. One night, a powerful laser sucks Howard out of his own world into Cleveland, Ohio, where he befriends and tries to help the career of fledgling rock star Beverly, who develops an almost bestial infatuation with him. A friendly scientist called Dr. Jenning reveals that his experimental laser is responsible for Howard's predicament, but when they try to reverse the process, Jenning becomes possessed by another alien, a dark overlord, hell-bent on world domination. <laughs> Howard has to team up with Beverly's hapless friend Phil and for some reason pilot an ultralight to rescue the starlet before the dark overlord can bring more of his scorpion-tailed friends to Earth for a stop-motion invasion. <laughs> Who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> and now we've got to talk about it. Wow. <laughs> oh, no. Be right back. And faster than the flick of a duck's tail, we're back. Dan, you hadn't seen this movie before. What was your first experience of watching it like? Well, I mean, in the immortal words of the podcast, how did this get made? How did this get made? I just don't understand who signed off on this and how did why, why, look, George Lucas was on board uh, I just don't understand this movie is so bizarre I would say it's one of the most bizarre movies we've covered on the podcast and it doesn't even have that excuse that it's some low budget horror movie it's a high budget Hollywood movie with known actors <laughs> I don't understand <laughs> It's pretty mind-bending. So this is the first ever Marvel feature film. Wow. The first ever. Yes. Right. Yep. Technically, there were some Spider-Man episodes of the TV show and Hulk episodes that were released theatrically in Europe, but this is the first big-budget feature film outing for a Marvel character. Uh -huh. And out of all the things they could have chosen, <laughs> they pick Howard the Duck, who... <laughs> was kind of a fringe character is the sense that I'm getting. I'm not a huge comic book guy, so mm. I didn't know much about it. But Howard was created by Steve Gerber and artist Val Mayerick. I'm probably saying that wrong. Uh -huh. Appeared in a 1973 issue of Marvel's comic Adventure Into Fear and eventually became his own character. And he was kind of a sardonic, dry, satirical almost metatextual character. Right. Sending up things that were happening in society at the time or even things that were happening in comic books at the time. And I don't know, he was never hugely successful. He never had a very long continuous run as a comic book. But for some reason, George Lucas liked it and decided <laughs> that this would be the first movie that they would do after <laughs> Return of the Jedi. After Star Wars is over, what do I do next? Howard the Duck. Yeah. That's the one. That's the one. <laughs> I, I mean, the first glaringly strange component of the film is the design of Howard the Duck himself. Mm. What <laughs> is going on here? He looks like just a furry white man with a big, bulbous duck head. And I thought, surely that's not what a comic looked like. And I looked at the comic, and sure enough, he doesn't look like that at all. No. He looks much more like Donald Duck. Yeah. So that very cartoony, still duck-looking character, because 
How the duck in this movie does not really resemble a duck. <laughs> no. At all. And he has made two cameo appearances, no, three cameo appearances in modern Marvel movies. So he's been in the end credit sequences of both Guardians of the Galaxies movies and apparently yes. he's in a blink and you'll miss him cameo in Endgame. Oh. So he has shown up looking like he did in the comics as a CG created character yes. in modern Marvel movies voiced by Seth Green oh. but yeah he looks like a baby in a costume and the thing is because it's they're doing it practically yes. so it's live action it's a little person in the costume primarily Ed Gale who played Chucky occasionally in the first Child's Play movie. <laughs> right. And Jordan Prentice, who I think was 13 or 14 years old, was a child little person. Uh -huh. But it sort of looks like a child in a costume. It does. Because the head is so big because it's got the animatronics in it. Yeah. And it was, you know, quite an achievement. It's the first freestanding animatronic character. Right. So he didn't have wires coming out of him. It's all radio controlled. Oh. But because the head is disproportionately big compared to the body you only ever see that in babies so the thing that you get when you look at it is this is a toddler in a duck costume <laughs> not what you should get from a sardonic mm. countercultural no cigar chomping guy it's just yeah. weird <laughs> i mean for the first time ever in a movie i thought to myself I wished he was CGI. Mm. <laughs> and that has never happened before. Normally I'm always pining for I wish it was practical effects. Yeah. But wow, the practical effects, as impressive as they are, do not convey the character <laughs> of Howard the Duck <laughs> at all. And at the start as well, when they've got other duck characters, it's just horrifying. <laughs> they've got a female duck in a bath with her boobs out. <laughs> I don't want to see this. <laughs> Who said this was a good idea? Duck nipples wasn't top of your priority list. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did want to do it as a computer animated character because, of course, Industrial Light and Magic was experimenting in computer animation then. They'd done a fully-fledged character in a sort of nightmare sequence in the young Sherlock Holmes the year before. Uh -huh. So they were trying to do it, and it wasn't until sort of a couple of years later, you've got Morphing in Willow, and then the year after that, the Pseudopod Tentacle in the Abyss, and then uh -huh. Terminator 2, and then they start getting there. But this was far too early, and their first attempts didn't work out so well. And yeah. what's hilarious is that because this film bombed so badly, and George Lucas was coming out of a really messy divorce where he lost a lot of his assets... He had to sell Pixar, which wasn't called Pixar, but it was his computer animation division. He had to sell it to try and stay afloat. And they went off and became Pixar and did Toy Story and became huge. Yeah. <laughs> I heard as well that the main shareholder that bought Pixar was Steve Jobs. Right. I did not even know that he had a big stake in Pixar. So that's interesting. Yeah, it's amazing. So yeah, Howard doesn't work, let's be honest. No. <laughs> Throughout the movie, other people keep thinking that it's a child in a suit. Yeah. So you're constantly reminded that it's a small person in a suit all the time. <laughs> yeah. At one point, the police even pin him up against something and rip all of his clothes off to try and... And try to take it. it off, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. So... I don't know, it just doesn't work. No, does no, not at all. And also the, the reactions from people. A lot of the characters in the movie just thought, hey, it's just a person in a fluffy suit. Mm. And other people, the range of reactions was either, oh, it's just a person in a suit, to, oh my God, the scariest thing I've ever seen, I'm going to scream my face off. <laughs> it just didn't kind of correlate to what I was looking at on screen. Some of the writing in this film and the ways that characters were reacting just didn't. It wasn't a reflection on any reality that ever exists. No. It's like this <laughs> other reality of Earth and Cleveland that no one knows about as it has ever experienced no. as well. I intend to ask on Twitter the inhabitants of Cleveland whether Cleveland is really this inhospitable and violent. <laughs> yeah. Because the hostility towards Howard sometimes, when he first lands outside Beverly's nightclub, 
he's immediately set upon by the most 80s punk gang you've ever seen uh-huh. with chain mail and fishnets, neon pink fishnets with holes in. And the first thing they think of is we're going to attack him. And mm. if they think it's a child in a suit... That's kind of weird behaviour. I know. And then he goes into a bar and he ends up in a bar fight Mm -hmm. and gets thrown around and later he's in a diner and after Beverly's sexually harassed by three random truckers for no reason, it erupts Hmm. into a fight in this diner and all of the diner patrons, all of them, everybody there joins in in pinning Howard down and sprinkling him with seasoning and getting ready to chop his head off and eat him. (laughs) All of them. Every customer's involved in this. What is wrong with Cleveland? <laughs> I know, I know, exactly. That's, uh, this is what I'm saying. This is not a reflection on any reality that exists <laughs> on Earth. I found quite a lot of similarities between this movie being just like this really goofy, cartoony movie to another movie called Who Framed Roger Rabbit, oh, yeah. in which a character is animated. And I kind of wish How to Duck was an animated 2D character. It would have mm. worked better. It would have worked with the sort of ridiculousness of the situations. But having him being this obviously small person in a suit, mm. it wasn't convincing. No. It's very, very strange. (laughs) And what's even stranger is Beverly's sort of uh, relationship with him Mm. and his sort of pseudo-flirting and the almost sex scene that transpired. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. It's so (laughs) odd. And there's something about this movie that I've seen in a YouTube video by the pop culture detective, I think I've Mm. mentioned him before, Mm. Uh, and he put a video out about how Big Bang Theory is like this adorable misogyny. And I kind of felt the same with Howard the Duck. He was a duck, and so he could say kind of sexist things and refer to women as toots and doll. and yeah. But it was excusable because he's just like a little duck. And Beverly kind of going, oh, Ducky, oh, that's offensive, but oh. (laughs) And it's just like, come on, be offended. Just because he's a little duck doesn't mean he can get away with stuff like that. No. Well, at least she calls him on his uh, constant flirtation with her and she just keeps upping the stakes and upping the stakes until they're right on the verge of actually having sex and then he bottles it and pulls the sheet over his head and says, be gentle. But that is the most notorious aspect of this movie, even before it came out. I was looking back at contemporary reviews in things like Starlog magazine where they were previewing the film and talking about it coming up Uh and even then the producer Gloria Katz and the director Willard Hoyk not sure how to pronounce that, Mm -hmm. were constantly having to defend Leah Thompson's relationship with Howard the Duck and the fact that there was an almost sex scene in the movie. (laughs) And this is (laughs) Leah Thompson, who the year before had been in Back to the Future, seducing her own son. (laughs) So she's not got a great history. I did want to uh, quickly mention the link between this movie and Hollow Man. Ah. Leah Thompson is in Back to the Future and also Elizabeth Shue is in Back to the Future as the recast Jennifer character ah, in the second third yes, movie. Yes, in the second one onwards, yeah. Ah, so there's a, there's a few yeah. three degrees of Kevin Bacon going on there. Uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the sex in Howard the Duck then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a very sexually charged movie. I was trying to write down all the things in it, remembering that this is a kid's movie, isn't it? But is it though? Is but it? This is the question. I was was questioning what was the demographic because there was so much sort of sexual innuendo and adult themes. I mean, ducks with boobs. <laughs> Surely kids don't want to see that. But then it was so goofy and ridiculous and the villain was just this crazy mad scientist mm. that you would 
only see in a kid's movie. So I thought it was very confusing. It is. Who the audience was. Because the mode of performance is really quite heightened and childish. So yes. just things like when Leah Thompson's reacting to being told to leave Howard alone when he's out by the fountain and says, you know, go away. I just, I don't want your help. Go away. Yes. And she's sort of, oh, so long, ducky, hump. You yeah, know, I know. It's just really cartoony and silly. Exactly. So you think, okay, so this is for kids. And then he gets a job <laughs> <laughs> in like an, an adult sex sauna or something. Yeah. What is good. <laughs> He's just like bill deep in lube all day. It's terrible. (laughs) What's going on here? Like right from the very beginning, he gets a booty call from a girlfriend on his answer phone. He's looking at a porn mag. Uh Then you've got the naked duck in the bath with the duck boobs. Mm -hmm. Then he accidentally runs his hand up the thigh of a woman who's copping off with a guy behind a dumpster. Uh After that, he prevents Beverly from being sexually assaulted by two punks. Then when he's asleep, she finds an unwrapped condom in his wallet. Mm, I know. Uh, His first job is in a knocking shop. Cherry Bomb's manager intends to extort Beverly for sexual favours. He calls it career manipulation. He's holding back their money in return for sex. It's just sex, 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 constantly. Yes. It's appalling. Yes. I know. I mean, even in that sex scene when uh, Howard gets aroused, I mean, the feathers on his head get all bristled. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if that's not sexual innuendo, I don't know what is. No, and, the, and it took months, apparently, for them to work that special effect out and to get it to work. Oh, So somebody's right. job at ILM in 1986 was making a duck's feathers look aroused. Oh. (laughs) Fancy putting that on your resume. (laughs) And even Howard himself, when he comes into the dressing room after Cherry Bomb have played one of their gigs, he's talking about having sex appeal. Some guys have it, some guys don't or something. Mm -hmm. But you look like a child in a duck costume. This feels so wrong. Yeah. And Phil, which is Tim Robbins in one of his very first roles later to be in the Shawshank Redemption and so on and so forth, he shows up and says, sorry, I missed the show, but I came to watch you undress. Yeah, I know. It's just, and again, it's, yeah, it's the adorable misogyny again, isn't it? It's Mm. oh, Phil, yeah, yeah. he's got glasses and he does goofy faces, so it's fine. Yeah, he's a scientist. He's a bit eccentric. (laughs) It's fine. (laughs) It's fine. It's a very sexually charged movie for a children's movie. I was watching it with my eyes like saucers, mm. <laughs> thinking, what the hell? And that is the question that I kept asking myself. What the hell am I watching? What? <laughs> and then the next scene, what the hell is this? Even just the act structure of this movie, I feel like there's the first half and then there's the second half, and they're completely different movies. Yeah. The first half is just your bog standard I'm an alien, everything's strange, oh my god, hilarity, I need to find a way to get home. Yeah. And then that's it. Yeah. It pretty much almost ends by the halfway mark, and then you, you get introduced to what I would say was the worst villain I have ever seen in a movie. <laughs> I just could not get on board the Jennings character being sort of possessed by this dark overlord and all of a sudden he just talks like this and I am something else it's like oh is this for real did someone okay this I know what he's doing there's no effect on his voice it's just him putting on the silly voice I don't know it just it just got ridiculous Yes, structurally the movie is a mess. You've got 45 minutes of bog-standard 80s fish-out-of-water comedy. This Mm -hmm. is the same year that you've got things like Crocodile Dundee, which is Australian in New York. Oh, this isn't a knife. That's a knife. (laughs) There were so many of these movies where a special effects creation would end up in a modern-day city rather than you spending time in their fantasy adventure world. Gloria Katz, the producer very bravely said Howard's first adventure had to deal with problems on Earth. First adventure. She's imagining this is going to set the movie up 
for a whole range of sequels. Oh, <laughs> this is a franchise in the making. Oh, my God. But they thought, you know, we've got to get people used to Howard the Duck, so it has to be on Earth. And it's just like all the other corner-cutting sci-fi movies like Masters of the Universe, where they don't set it in Eternia. All of a sudden, they're running around some city or other. Yeah. So many of these movies do this in that they didn't need to. This is a George Lucas production. Mm. They had $37 million to spend on this movie. I do Still, they set it on Earth and just do fish-out-of-water comedy for mm. 45 minutes. And then just at the point where you think, okay, so we've had Act 1, Act 2, and now Act 3 is, uh -huh. can he get home? And what a difficult decision that will be. Hang on, we're only an hour in. Yeah. <laughs> and then this completely different science fiction action adventure movie starts and it carries on for another hour. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> with the worst villain because he's not even the villain to start off with. He's kind of their friend. Yeah. And then he goes crazy. Uh, if you really break down what happens in the film as well, they drive away from the science facility and then they almost crash into a diner, have an altercation in the diner, and then drive back back like yeah. what sort of journey is this <laughs> have they just gone 10 minutes down the road and they're just driving 10 minutes back yeah what <laughs> they just go for lunch and then come back again <laughs> yeah and that oh that ultralight scene is just, it's like action for the sake of action like mm. surely they should have just flown a little higher mm. but they didn't no. they flew very low <laughs> so they could almost crash into cars yeah. and almost crash into trucks and stuff it was just like, this is just action for the sake of it. Obviously, that thing can fly higher than that. Yeah. It's like the helicopters in Kong Skull Island. I don't know if you've seen that one. Yes, I have. Yes. <laughs> just go up. <laughs> up. Just, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, none of the action comes organically out of the story at all. It just seems to happen. Like, they have a car chase just so that something can happen. And Howard takes a back seat. You've had 45 minutes of fish-out-of-water comedy that very much focuses on Howard, where the highest stakes a pretty much Beverly's music career. Yes. And then all of a sudden you're launched into this alien invasion thriller where you just have random special effects sequences exploding. Yes. But they just end up back at the same lab for the finale. Yeah. Why? <laughs> I also feel like Howard is barely a hero. Oh, yeah. Especially in the last scene because Beverly is perfectly able after she's been untied, and so is Dr. Jenning. They're perfectly able people that they could have done all the things that Howard was doing, mm. but they keep kind of instructing him, Howard, you have to do this. Here. <laughs> here's a laser. Yeah, here's a laser. <laughs> Shoot this. <laughs> Just, he, he had so much help to becoming that hero mm. that I yeah. didn't actually feel anything for him at the end. Like, <laughs> right. oh, he could have died. Oh, well, I guess. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he didn't do a lot of great stuff. <laughs> I mean, even in the diner scene, did Howard get out of it by himself? No, no, no. he didn't. He has no special skills. Well, you forget Quack Fu, of course, oh, which he is an on. expert in. <laughs> yeah, in all those beautifully choreographed fight scenes that really convinced you that a three-foot-tall man in a duck suit was able to just knock uh -huh. fully grown men sent flying no. by Quack no, Fu. No, mm -hmm. no, no. And again, <laughs> the puns. Come on, they were awful Ugh. every time. Grown. <laughs> oh. And they weren't even clever mm. either. I mean, MasterCard was just called Mallard Card. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Playboy was Play Duck. Mm. How long did it take the writers to think of that? I just, uh. Rolling Egg for Rolling Stone magazine. I know. Raiders of the Lost Duck. I know. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> It's interesting you say that about the finale where Howard isn't really a hero. They just keep handing him things when they could have easily just taken care of it themselves. Yeah. And it's a bizarre ending anyway because it, in terms of genre, it comes out of nowhere. All of a sudden, it's like this big James Bond villain secret layer with... A laser. Giant yes. world-destroying <laughs> device. Yes. Yeah. And it doesn't help that you've got John Barry doing the music as well, the composer who scored the overwhelming majority of James Bond movies. 
movies at that time. Right. And yes. so it turns into somewhere between a James Bond finale and a Western with Jenning and Howard the Duck facing off and Jenning even spits on the floor. But, oh, he's an alien, so it's acid and it's mm-hmm. seeping through the floor and knocks his lab coat out of the way so that he's got easy access to his gun holster that he doesn't have yeah. because he just fires lasers out of his hand. So it's a Western James Bond science fiction comedy yeah. movie. And then it turns into a creature feature <laughs> when he becomes this ginormous predator, scorpion, spider, monster thing. <laughs> I mean, impressive effects, mm. and uh, is it all stop motion? It is, yeah. It's all Phil Tippett stop motion work again. It's not as good as Willow a few years later, I don't think, and not even as good as Dragon Slayer a few years before. Yeah, because sometimes the lighting doesn't quite convince you that this element is part of the same scene. No, no, not at all. Could have been because it was a dark mm. environment, sort of a darker scene. I, I've always found anything green screen with night time mm. even like the first Men in Black movie yeah. there's a big green screen shot where the spaceship crashes to the ground and it obviously looks like a green screen Yeah. so maybe that was the case but yeah it did not look like it was part of the scene and even the appendages that would shoot into the actual scene mm. didn't quite work yeah. they kind of needed more of them to sort of mm. blur the line between... Convince you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a very odd finale and sort of tension-free. And, and at this point, because you've had almost a three-act structure in the first half, and then all of a sudden you, the third act is another hour and it's got its own three-act structure, mm-hmm. you're kind of bored by that point as well. You're kind of thinking, can this movie just end now, <laughs> maybe? <laughs> I mean, I was kind of excited that there was some sort of action. Mm. The introduction of Jenning as an alien overlord. It's like, oh, yay, something that I wasn't expecting Mm. because the first 40 minutes I expected all that. But, yeah, bonkers. (laughs) And also the effects as well because is it all drawn on? Lightning and electricity. So it has this kind of almost cartoony look to it, Mm. which doesn't kind of gel with the rest of the film (laughs) because you never saw any of those kind of effects previously. So, I don't know. I don't understand. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, there is something to be said for the practical elements of the film. Although it's completely ridiculous and only there for its own sake, the ultralight sequence is pretty exciting because it's entirely practical There's no green screen shots in that at all. Uh So every time you cut to Howard the Duck and Tim Robbins as Phil in the ultralight flying along, it's either that they are actually flying along. Apparently Tim Robbins did have to learn how to fly an ultralight for that sequence okay? because you couldn't disguise him in some of the shots. And some of it, I guess, is just rigs that are attached to a trailer or something that's moving along in the traffic and they're just getting the reaction action shots that way Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. because it's all practical and none of it's green screened it's pretty exciting stuff it's well mounted i think it's all directed by joe johnson who would go on to direct the first captain america movie and the rocketeer because of his love of flying he's an ilm fx man originally all right so yeah there are sequences that are good yeah phil tippett's animation is good in the finale yeah it's a lavish production it's beautifully shot but just batch it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no doubt. That diner scene, amazing. Mm. Jennings lights up like a Ghostbuster ghost. He's all blue yeah. and shimmery and he's shooting all sorts of whatever mm. out of him. And you've got items on the counter of the diner just shooting up into the air. And that's all practical effects. It looks incredible. Yeah. But in the overall jigsaw puzzle of the movie, it's like, where did this come from? <laughs> yeah, it's all for naught because... Although it's impressively staged, you're never engaged with it because you just spend the whole movie with your eyebrows disappearing higher and higher up your head as you just (laughs) look at thinking, what? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I didn't feel any sort of sense of threat as well. Even though Jenning was insane with whatever powers he had, it all kind of came across as a little bit like, oh, they'll be fine. Yeah. 
It's ridiculous. Mm. A tentacle claw appendage is appearing from his mouth and just jabbing into the cigarette lighter of a truck. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, <laughs> sure. Yeah, that was cut from the UK version originally. <laughs> oh, was it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Because <laughs> I was pretty shocked. <laughs> No, I don't know if they were worried that it was too grim or whether they were worried that kids might stick their fingers in cigarette lighters in cars. I don't I don't know. Or their tongue. Oh. (laughs) The tone of the film is just all over the place because partly it's a wacky comedy, partly it's a rags to riches pop band story, Mm -hmm. and partly it's a science fiction world domination adventure. And it's all just sort of rammed in a mixer and stirred up and then splattered all over the screen (laughs) and it's very difficult to make anything out of it or engage with it in any meaningful way. Yes. I wanted to go back to talk about the characters, especially Beverly, Mm. because I did kind of notice that she was pretty much a manic pixie dream girl. Right, yeah. She was just a very eclectic, quirky, everything is fine, incredibly engaged with Howard and just, I will do everything for you, I will help (laughs) you, and... That's exactly what a Manic Pixie Dream Girl is. Just a sort of blank female character that's quirky that helps the male character sort of Mm. find his way and evolve and develop in his character. And, yeah, it's kind of like, was she the proto-Manic Pixie Dream Girl? Yeah. No, that's a good call because she starts off as a bimbo. I mean, she even says at one point, this planet's called Earth, I think. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but being Leah Thompson, she can't quite come across as that dumb because she's a very intelligent actress who's done fine performances in so many other movies. Uh-huh. So she can't quite be reduced to a bimbo, but then she's just so accepting and compliant and helpful. Yes. And then in the end just ends up tied to the train tracks, in a way, <laughs> in the Western finale, just tied to the doom machine yeah. to be rescued, the damsel in distress. Mm. And, and sort of unchanging in her character. She She's the same at the start as at the end. Yeah, she doesn't develop. Phil, Tim Robbins' character, is this nerd that just seems to be perfectly accepting of everything and just cheerily go along with life-threatening situations throughout the whole thing. He disappears for a large chunk of the movie in the middle, Mm. which is really odd, and then just shows up again for the finale. Yeah. And Howard's character is so inconsistent. (laughs) Sometimes he is the cigar-chomping, oversexed, yes. sardonic character that he was originally written as. Yeah, the sort of 50s, like, typical male character that expects the female to do whatever he bids them to do. Exactly. And then sometimes he comes across as really quite naive and sweet and kind and out of his depth. Yes. So you don't really know who he is. And then sometimes he's supposed to be a hero. I mean, the UK, they renamed the movie Howard, A New Breed of Hero. Oh, really? Because they were trying to hide the fact that he was a duck. Oh, no. And yet the poster had an egg on it. I don't know. Oh. What were they thinking? Right, okay. But as a hero, okay, the first part of the movie is about him and he grows but the second half of the movie he's just sort of along for the ride being rescued even by the villain in the diner yes and then at the end as you say just being handed things and told what to do and yeah he's not heroic at all and yet sometimes at the beginning he's heroic because he intervenes when beverly's being attacked Mm, so mm, mm. i don't know i just couldn't get any sense of who he was or who he was meant to be yeah That's exactly it, because his sort of development as a character, there wasn't a steady incline or anything. There wasn't Mm. his A and his B at the end. Mm. It was just a big fluctuating mess of (laughs) sometimes he's brave, sometimes he's a sexist asshole. Like, I mean... (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Whatever he needed to be in any given scene, supposedly to get a laugh, but I never found him funny, crucially. There are a lot of characters in the movie I do find funny. Yes, but I never found Howard funny. Yes, at all. I found Phil, uh, Tim Robbins' character, hilarious. Yeah, just because he was just so over the top. Yeah, I mean everything he said was just side splitting. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing to see because you tend to think of Tim Robbins as a fairly serious actor and director now, who's yes. very focused on ethical causes and serious dramas that teach you something and then you see him goofing off in this movie and he's really funny yeah he really reminded me of rick moranis his kind of characters yeah just big glasses
glasses, just completely naive to social interactions, but incredibly smart. Similar to how he was in Ghostbusters mm. and, and Honey, I Chuck the Kid. Yeah, but about two feet taller. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> now it's time for Random Trivia. So, Dan, what fascinating piece of trivia has slipped off you like water off a duck's back today? Well, did you know, apparently, in a Twitter comment, Leah Thompson has stated that she still has the Les Paul guitar cherry bomb uh, that she plays in the movie and sometimes still plays it. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, she was really good in Cherry Bomb. I hope she releases an album one day. It'd be great. (laughs) Yeah, I'd buy it. (laughs) I mean, as cheesy as that last song was in the film, it's so Mm. catchy. I was singing it for Mm. days after. It's (laughs) super catchy. (laughs) Howard the Duck. Hey! (laughs) (laughs) My fascinating piece of trivia for you is that they were originally going down the route of hiring a musician to play Beverly in the movie. Oh, yes? One of the hot contenders was Tori Amos. Oh, wow. (laughs) This is when she was in her rock chick phase and she was in a band called Why Can't Tori Read, which was very much in the style of sort of synth rock oh. before Little Earthquakes and her more serious girl and a piano style of work. Yeah, right. So she was a front running contender to be Beverly in this movie. So we could have had Tori Amos in a thong <laughs> bending over out the <laughs> Oh, <dark>. no. <laughs> I don't know whether that would have been a better choice. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Because <laughs> Tori's had her own brush with bestiality anyway, because she became notorious for posing on the back cover of Boys for Pele, suckling a pig to her breast. Oh, okay. <laughs> People were a bit shocked. <laughs> yeah, that is a little shocking. Maybe she would have taken to this role like a duck to water. Oh, oh no, God, right? <laughs> Stop that now. <laughs> and that's our trivia. <laughs> So music is a big part of Howard the Duck. We have Thomas Dolby on hand, fresh off of his success with the song She Blinded Me With Science. I am not at all versed in who... Who is Thomas Dolby? (laughs) And why is he significant? Well, he was a British musician and producer and he had a massive hit with the song She Blinded Me With Science. Okay. But other than that... I don't know. He feels a bit like a one-hit wonder. I'm sure he's had a long and prestigious career, Uh but (laughs) that's all I really know him for. But obviously he was hot at the time, so they hired him initially to help the actresses playing the characters who were in the the band Cherry Bomb, Uh how to look like a band, how to pretend to play instruments and to mime. Yes. And then eventually, because they were so impressed with Leah Thompson's singing voice and the rest of the ladies' singing voice, voices yeah what you're actually hearing is actually them they sound amazing they do yeah leah thompson's great that's the one thing you can say about this movie i would buy a cherry bomb album i thought it was good (laughs) and i i mean that's one of my pet peeves of of music in movies when the actor or actress starts singing and it's just obvious that They've just got a, a singer yeah. that has a way better voice. <laughs> yeah, But you can hear the character and tone of Leah Thompson's voice when she's singing, and it's she's great. Yeah. Amazing. It's really good 80s synth rock for what it is. But yes. So, yeah, you've got Thomas Dolby writing five songs for the movie, and he was originally hired to do the score as well. Oh. But when he turned in some demos, they weren't terribly impressed, so they quickly scuttled over to John Barry, yes. thinking that the man who just won an Oscar for the score for Out of Africa and who had scored all of the James Bond movies and recently science fiction films like The Black Hole and so on. Uh He would be a good choice to score the movie but then they've discovered that they didn't really like his slow and stately music for the action sequences so then they hired the Hungarian composer Sylvester Levey who just had a massive hit composing the score for Airwolf oh. the TV series with the super helicopter <laughs> he came in because obviously they thought who can we get to rescore the ultralight action scene hmm flying vehicle <laughs> so, <laughs> oh no <laughs> they got Sylvester Levey to come in and 
do those sequences for the last portion of the movie is all Sylvester LeVay rescoring John Barry, mm-hmm. trying to incorporate themes from John Barry. Oh, wow. But with an 80s drum machine and a synthesizer and guitars and things like this. Oh. So the soundtrack is a complete potpourri of different contributors. How did you think it worked? Um, to be honest, I think I was just more flabbergasted by the visuals to notice the music. <laughs> the music, I mean, it worked, I guess, but it wasn't, it didn't stand out to me. Uh, I mean, at the start with the whole jazzy New York sort of sound, that was kind of cool, mm. but you didn't really hear that ever again. No. Uh, it didn't have that sort of self-reflection that it had at the start. No. <laughs> just launched straight into the 80s, synth rock and... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I honestly did not notice the rest of the score. Oh. <laughs> but, I mean, I yeah. guess I did actually notice the love theme with that flute that mm. would keep kind of recurring. That was kind of cool. Yeah, it's very beautiful. Cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> but memorable, I guess. But the action sequences, I didn't really remember at all. No. Music-wise. Well, the action scenes towards the end, it's all Sylvester LeVay, and it does feel very much like a TV series uh-huh. with a very small orchestra and a band playing. It does feel very much like an episode of Airwolf. Oh, right. Frankly. But you've got to feel bad for John Barry. Yeah, I, it must be so offensive having your music replaced or you being replaced as a composer by another composer on a film. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting that the very next movie that he did, The Living Daylights, which was his last score for a James Bond movie, all of a sudden, he's never done this before, there's a drum machine and a synth bass line running through all of the action sequences in The Living Daylights. No way. Yeah, 1987, (laughs) the year after Howard the Duck, all of a sudden, he's adopted the airwolf style in all of his action scenes. No. I mean, does it sound good, though? Does it sound good? I like it. I really like The Living Daylights. Okay. That's the one with Aha on the opening titles. I think it's great. (laughs) Okay. It's obviously a reaction to what happened to him on this movie. Oh, wow. (laughs) How the Duck (laughs) changing people's careers. Changing John (laughs) Barry, yeah. I did find also (laughs) sound-wise, like the sound design of the movie, it was kind of trying to do two things at the same time. Mm. So sound design, it felt like it was trying to be realistic, but other other times it felt very comical mm. and cartoony. Right. Like you said, uh, even when Beverly just goes hmm, and walks off, when they're hiding under the stairs from the people with guns mm. and they say, shoot the kill, and you can hear them go, gulp. Like, come on. Like, are we watching a cartoon? <laughs> the most cartoony part is when they almost crash into the diner and they sort of tap the window and it's got that wobble, like, woo, 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 woo sound. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. I kind of, if they were going to do that, they just needed more of it. Like, more comical, ridiculous sounds. Yeah. They couldn't settle on a tone, could they? It no. was either a big, extravagant, beautifully produced sci-fi action adventure movie, or it was a goofy fringe comedy that was just scrappy and silly and didn't take itself seriously at all. Yeah. But it kind of flirts with both. Yeah, exactly. And as a result, it doesn't really succeed in either. No. No, not at all. And you just feel confused (laughs) by how you're actually supposed to feel Mm. during the film as well because there is no clear tone, there's no clear audience, there's no clear (laughs) character development, there's no clear music. It's just a big, (laughs) I don't know, static of everything. (laughs) (laughs) It's just white noise. And sometimes the logic doesn't make any sense either, like the moment when Phil rejects the idea of stealing a cop car to get back to the lab on the basis that it's too conspicuous, but then suggests that they manually assemble and steal an ultralight and then fly it there. Yeah. As if that would be less (laughs) conspicuous. Yes, exactly. I mean, there's just so many scenes in this movie that just don't really make any sense. Mm. Even when they're... They're trying to get away from the cops or whatever and they're driving away from the science lab. And it's a car chase, but no one's actually chasing them. No. They're just driving (laughs) erratically on the road. (laughs) Like, the only reason they're in danger is because for some reason they put the guy that's going insane <laughs> in the driver's seat and told him, yeah, we, we should have this guy driving. Why? Why, <laughs> Why was it Beverly driving the car? I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe she couldn't drive, but even then, I think I would have had a crack at it rather than put either the duck or the insane person who's doubled over in pain <laughs> in the driving seat. Exactly. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to you live from the Movie Oubliette Theatre, it's the prestigious Moobly Awards. I'm sure you're all anxiously awaiting the arrival of our evil overlords, but in the meantime, we have the Moobly Awards, where we nominate a bunch of our favourite utterly idiotic parts of the film in a number of bird-brained categories that even George (laughs) Lucas would approve of. (laughs) <laughs> Best quote My favourite characters in this movie are all the waitresses And my favourite oh. quote comes from Roxanne, the waitress Who, on seeing Dr Jennings looking like he's been exploded through a hedge Beverly and a pint-sized <laughs> duck character <laughs> Just turns to her colleague and says This is why I hate the night shift Oh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> I love her snarkiness, yes. It's wonderful. And you? I mean, I would say Phil was my favourite character in this film, and he has Mm -hmm. all the best lines. (laughs) So they're all backstage with Cherry Bomb, and Phil is Mm. is talking to Howard, and he's trying to uh, talk about uh, his arrival and the significance of it. And then Howard just asks, what's a pizza? And then Phil just completely matter-of-factly, as if he was the absent-minded scientist that he was, just replies, it's a circular Italian food object. (laughs) (laughs) Most 80s moment. For me, it has to be the keytar, the guitar-shaped synthesizer played by Holly Robinson as KC in Cherry Bomb. I just love those synthesizers Mm. that have got a handle on and a strap so that you can strut around on stage and be a rock chick whilst playing a synthesizer. (laughs) It's so 80s. So 80s. I I feel like they're coming back though. I think they are. You're absolutely right. This one was the Roland Axis from 1985. And interestingly, it was the first keytar to include aftertouch. Oh, I only just recently found out what Aftertouch was. So I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I still don't know. Maybe you can explain. Aftertouch, I just found out it, it means that once you push the key down, if you put more pressure on it, you can assign yeah. Aftertouch to various parameters. So if you yeah. assign it to vibrato, if you push the key a little harder, like you kind of press further, uh, it will engage the vibrato. Yeah. It's, okay. It's, so it, it makes a much more of an expressive instrument, not just a keyboard instrument. So there you go. <laughs> it's the first MIDI controller keytar with aftertouch. Interestingly, it wasn't Thomas Dolby's favourite one. He preferred the Casio AZ-1. So there you oh, go. right, right, right. <laughs> well, funnily enough, my most 80s moment of the film is also music-related. Okay. In this movie, I think, I believe... There is a 909 Roland drum machine in Beverly's apartment Ah. that Howard turns on. Ah, And it it just like filled me with glee because those things are so sought after now. Yeah. Yeah. Such a classic sound, 909. Yeah. Is that the one that he turns on and then starts jamming the Howard the Duck theme on the keyboard? Yes. Yeah. That's it. That's it. (laughs) Best hair or costume? Undoubtedly, the hair award must go to Leah Thompson in yeah, this movie. Of course. It's the most aggressively 80s hair I have ever seen. And it's all real. There's no wig there. It's crimped. It's fluffy. It's big. It's hair sprayed within an inch of its life. It's mm-hmm. probably singularly responsible for a hole in the ozone layer above <laughs> Cleveland. It's amazing. And when you couple that with her outfits, she's got like pink leggings, hot pink pixie boots, manic pixie dream girl, Mm. obviously, crumpled leg warmers, a brown suit jacket with folded sleeves. My goodness, she is so 80s. Yeah. It's amazing. She kind of reminded me of parents that let their children just dress themselves. All right, just dress yourself (laughs) when you're, you're five years old. And that's what happened 
with Leah Thompson's character. (laughs) Because there were things on top of things that should just not go. She had like a vest over a shirt with suspenders. That's too many things going on. (laughs) You're right. It's like a 90s kid that's found their parents' 80s clothes in the attic and they've just rolled in them. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I did read that she sort of based her look on uh, Cindy Lauper and Madonna. Right. And it, yeah, really, yeah, it really shows. Sense. It really shows. Just like crazy colors and everything. And <laughs> what with the fingerless gloves in the 80s? Why did people <laughs> yeah, wear fingerless gloves all the time? <laughs> Favourite scene! I guess the diner scene, I love the use of practical effects, having items flying around the Mm. room, and even Jenning having just telekinetic powers for no apparent reason, being able to (laughs) just push tables and chairs aside and push them back. It looked great. It looked great. And I'm glad it was all practical because it, it was very, very convincing. Yeah, it's an amazing set piece and I really like it because of the humour as well. Another one of my favourite waitresses in that scene oh, yes. is Crystal, who's like this cool stoner chick with glasses. Yeah. And there's loads of really funny rapid one-liners where they're all talking at cross-purposes to each other. Uh-huh. Like, she brings them the special and it's got eggs in it, so Howard freaks out. Yeah. And Jennings, as the Dark Overlord says... This will mean the destruction of every living thing on the planet. (laughs) And she says, but you haven't even tasted it yet. (laughs) It's a weird, it's like 20 minutes that's from another movie that's just in here. And it's it's a great set piece. It's Mm. funny. It's sharply written. It's really well performed by everybody, especially... Crystal, the waitress. Yes. And huge special effects, practical effects too. So, Mm. yeah, I love that scene too. That's my favourite. Oh, right. Most cliché sci-fi moment. We've said it many times. Blue Lightning. Oh, yeah. It's a sci-fi movie. (laughs) You've got to have hand-animated, glowy blue lightning over the top of the movie, like The Emperor and Return of the Jedi. Mm, Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I do like the fact that when Jennings does his zapping through his eyes, that first off you get this sort of energy bar building up that comes out of the sides of his head horizontally. Like it's slowly building up before he then fires. I've always loved that. I've always remembered it, Mm. even from when I watched it as a kid. Oh, wow, yeah. And it's kind of like a... A waveform, like he's, I don't know, it's like he's got music coming out of his head or something. Yeah, right. So, yeah, I do love that effect. I would say the <laughs> worst effect was when when he uh, ignites things, it's just like two little fireballs come from his eyes, but they're obviously just being composited <laughs> over his eyes, like, like clip art. Oh, it's just the worst. <laughs> yeah. I know, it's something a YouTuber would do now. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, my favourite cliche of the film, a uh, sci-fi cliche, would be the name of the science lab, mm-hmm. Dynatechnics. Science labs in the 80s and 90s were always dynamic or dyna and technics or cyber <laughs> or net or something like this. Uh, it's just ridiculous, <laughs> like how many sort of iterations of exactly the same words they can kind of smash together. Yeah, so many of them. There must have been somebody who specialised with coming up with these names because you have to pick one that isn't a real company name. Exactly. You have to find an original one. So somebody's job is finding one that hasn't been used in a movie already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Best special effect. My favourite effect was the final form of Jennings. Well, I guess he's not Jennings anymore. Mm. The Dark Overlord. Mm. Like I said, Predator, Scorpion, Spider thing. (laughs) I just, I loved the sort of range of motion that it had. It really looked alive. Mm. It looked disgusting though. Yeah, it It did. It looked like someone needs to kill that thing (laughs) immediately. (laughs) Yeah, it was amazing. Phil Tippett really gave himself a lot to work with because there were tentacles and teeth and yeah. tails and arms. And yeah. oh, I had no idea what I'd seen after no. that. There's so much going on <laughs> on that thing. Exactly. How about you? Favourite effect? <laughs> well, you've mentioned this already. I kind of like all of the hand-animated laser bolty stuff that goes on. I know it's really cartoony and it doesn't belong to the rest of the movie, 
But I just love all that stuff from Ghostbusters and other movies, all of that. You never get that now. You never get that sort yeah. of hand animated stuff that's glowing off the screen and so 80s and neon that it blinds you and it doesn't look like it's part of the scene at all. But I, I just appreciate the craftsmanship that must yes. have been involved because they hand drew that stuff frame by frame, ah. 24 frames a second. So. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Favorite sound effect. Initially, I was going to say the window wobble. <laughs> uh, but there is a sound, and it's right at the end when they've exploded all the incoming aliens. And I, I swear I heard it, but it sounds like R2-D2 screaming. It's got that really... Oh. I don't Ooh, know whether it's, yeah. it's actually there, but... Play that scene again. It just—I swear it sounds mm. like it. And because the movie is just sprinkled with George Lucas references, oh, yeah. like to Indiana Jones and Star Wars, mm. all throughout the movie. Even at the start, where there are two sons, I just immediately thought of, oh yeah, this is a Star <laughs> Wars reference. So <laughs> yeah. I, I swear it's R two D two. I swear. Oh, I will listen to that again. I didn't spot that. <laughs> My favourite comes right after another Lucas cliche, which is the Wilhelm scream, which crops up <laughs> in the scene with the ultralight, where Howard is dive bombing duck hunters <laughs> yes. to send them sprawling into the water. And right at the end of that scene, after the last bunch of hunters goes into the water, a duck happens to come across the screen. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously it was a complete accident, but on the soundtrack you hear a duck and it's that sort of laughing sound that they say, rrr, rrr, rrr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the duck's really enjoying the revenge that Howard has managed to carry out on the hunters. <laughs> <laughs> Most funniest <laughs> moment. So my funniest moment is Tim Robbins as Phil. It's during the ultralight sequence and it's after he gets thrown out of it so he's sort of dangling by his legs by his knees and he gets loop de looped while he's like that oh, and yes. dunked in water because Howard's flying too low and finally when Phil manages to get back into the ultralight and Howard says welcome back Philzy he says thanks Howard it's great to be back through gritted teeth <laughs> <laughs> it's just this one moment where Phil loses his cool he's yeah. like genuinely really fucked off at that <laughs> point <laughs> and I really enjoyed it yes. because he was still lovable while he was doing it. I just mm. thought it was great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have to say the funniest part of the film is another Phil scene. It's his <laughs> introduction, actually. So they, Beverly and Howard have gone into his lab and he bursts out of his lab and he's just so excited because there's a new scientific discovery and so he <laughs> intrudes into a room with all the other scientists and he exclaims listen everybody I've seen it it's in there it's a uh... and then he has this big pause because everyone's looking at him like he's gone nuts <laughs> and he pauses and he pauses and then he says it's nothing. Ha 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 ha. It's nothing. <laughs> Never mind. And he is just <laughs> manic the way that he plays out that scene. Uh, the most <laughs> insane character I've ever seen Tim Robbins play. <laughs> he even distorts on the microphone. He's so loud in that scene. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's our Mooblies. Yeah. Yay. Okay, we are back with the final verdict. Should Howard the Duck be propelled out into the world on a flying sofa enjoyed by the masses? Or should it be exploded with a neutron disintegrator and buried in the depths of the oubliette never to be spoken of again? Conrad... <laughs> What were your final thoughts? Well, I don't know. With Howard the Duck, it's kind of one of those movies that everybody wants to dump on. It's notorious for being a massive bomb when it came out and uh -huh. became a laughing stock for years after and something that George Lucas never talks about. In this book I've got of the history of industrial light and magic that goes breathlessly through every movie they ever worked on, right. it's mentioned once Ooh. as being the movie where they pioneered 
a digital means of removing wires. So it, they kind of invented Photoshop oh. for that movie. Okay. So it's kind of tempting to just rag on this movie, but but on the other hand, it's a lavish studio production, big budget movie with practical effects and expensive stop motion and duck costumes <laughs> and, and big name stars. So you kind of think maybe you revisit it and it's not quite as bad as everybody makes out. But boy, it really is. It just is a floating unflushable turd of a movie <laughs> that makes no sense whatsoever. I don't know what audience they were going for. The main character does not work. He doesn't have a consistent character. He's not a hero. He doesn't convince you that he's alive. The structure of the story makes no sense because you get 45 minutes of a fish-out-of-water comedy and then an hour of an alien invasion movie. Mm -hmm. You're never engaged with it. I mean, there are some sequences that are laugh out loud funny, like the diner scene, which I really enjoy. Mm. And the ultralight sequence is kind of exciting. But both of them come out of nowhere. As you've said, they kind of go there and do these things for no reason and then go back to where they started just mm. for the finale. Even though it's obvious and cliched, I would toss Howard back in the oubliette <laughs> forever and slam the door, to be honest. Yeah. How about you? I, I'm sure, I'm sure. There are um, a, a lot of people out there that have a, a incredible nostalgia for this movie and watching it as a kid and being like, oh my God, it's crazy and and it's a duck and they go on this adventure and there's, <laughs> there's an alien invasion and they have that sort of nostalgia a, attachment to the film. And mm. I have to say, as much as this film completely completely sucks. <laughs> I really enjoyed dumping on this film. It's a lot of fun to critique. It's one of those films that I have to say is so bad, it's good. It is so bad. It is terrible. I mean, if you want to watch a movie yeah. and poke fun at it and have a couple of mates around and be under the influence of whatever you take, this is the movie to watch because it is just nuts. <laughs> it's like a fever dream of just stuff that gets vomited at you. It's it's an experience. I think I think people should experience it. I'm never going to release this film from the early end. It needs to be buried. <laughs> Okay, well, as many people are fond of in the movie, let's just grab hold of how the duck's kicking and screaming and throw yes. him back Jenny, in there. Yeah. Oh, give him a kick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Well, thank you, patrons, for yeah. giving us the joy <laughs> of watching out the duck. Actually, I did really enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> how on earth did that movie get made? I am baffled my word what a turkey just <laughs> terrible sorry you're just slipping into bird puns <laughs> <laughs> any turkeys next episode conrad well we thought that we would retreat to the moderate safety of horror for our next episode oh, yes. so we will be checking out one of the lesser known and lesser talked about wes craven movies the 1988 fantasy horror, The Serpent and the Rainbow. Oh, I can't wait. Where's Craven? We've never done him before. We haven't, no. It's a very interesting horror film. It stars Bill Pullman, and it's loosely based on a non-fiction book of the same name by an ethnobotanist. Oh. And it's all about uh, trying to find a drug that induces zombieism. Apparently, okay, which uh, really exists or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we'll find out. Should be fascinating. And if you want to keep up with us, we are on all social platforms: Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as Movie Oubliette. We always love your feedback and comments. And what did you think about Howard the Duck? Was was it your favorite <laughs> childhood movie? Or were you just as confused as we were? <laughs> Do you like a bit of duck boob? <laughs> If you do, then email us at movie.oubliette at gmail 
com. And if you're enjoying the show, why not rate and review us on iTunes or whichever platform you are consuming us on? It really helps us out and we do appreciate it. Yeah. And I mean, Howard the Duck was chosen by our patrons. So why not become a patron mm. and <laughs> yeah. put us through the ordeal of another movie <laughs> that we might not, might not like? Uh, go to yeah. Patreon. And for a dollar, you can suggest a movie. And for five dollars, you get access to all our awesome goodies. And we have some exciting extras planned this year. We do, yes. And of course, there's always the three thrill of being able to torture us by picking a movie like Howard the Duck oh, for us yes. to watch. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks for listening, everyone. Always an experience. <laughs> Bye for now. Goodbye. review the films others tend to forget. Come with us and open up the movie you yet. Chilling anymore. The transformation is complete. I am now someone else.